when we think about the church, we think about one another, sometimes we think, boy, we're awfully small. Anyone ever thought that? Boy, we're awfully small. And uh, if you look at the number of people that are on the planet, or no, when I was when I was young, like you know, some of the young people here, there were about four billion people on the planet. Now there's almost eight. The planet's filling up. If you haven't noticed, it's become a lot more crowded. You know, those of us who are a little older notice it a bit more. But uh, the current estimates, I think, are around 7.8 billion people on the planet now. And if you think about it, people who believe and, and practice, as we do, are very few, especially when you consider it in that context. If you look at the United Church of God, which you know, is just one facet of, of God's church, it's about 7,000 people, and um, I think that's the U.S. numbers, and that's about one in a million. So that's pretty small, right? Uh, and if you add in you know, other Church of God groups, uh, you might get up to 25, 30, maybe 50,000, I don't know. That's still really small. <laughs> really, really small. And there may be other groups of people out there that we don't know about. And that happens from time to time. But however you slice it, it is a very tiny, tiny number. So I ask you, is smallness an indication of failure? Is that a problem? Or is it Christ's intent, because this is Christ's church, is it his intent to keep the first resurrection small? What is he up to? We don't know. When I'm not going to try and answer number questions. That's, that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm going to talk about smallness. I'm going to talk about smallness. Because I think that God does say, I'm going to work through small things. And he says to his church, he calls us the little flock. And he says that in a way that is endearing. You know, you might say that to a child, you know, my little one. And he says that to his church, my little flock. So when we're gathered today on the day of Pentecost, we think about the first fruits. And the first fruits offering that we see going all the way back to Leviticus 23, which I'm going to do, Leviticus 23, verse 17, the first fruits offering is very small, very small. They are doing a, uh, a harvest offering, and just a very small portion of it is used here. The whole day of Pentecost is from verse 15 through to verse 22, but I'm just going to jump in and look at verse 17, okay? Verse 17, where there's something special about the day of Pentecost in verse 17. It says, for wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two-tenths of an ephah of the finest flour baked with yeast as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. So the first fruits offering on which the day of Pentecost is kind of keyed around, in addition to other aspects, you know, like counting down and all that. But when you go back to the original instructions, this is what they were to do. Wave these two little loaves of bread. And the first fruit offerings, they establish or they reflect a biblical principle in which a small portion of a very large crop is presented before God. And this tiny, itsy bitsy portion offered has a sanctifying effect. It, it has a, a, an effect on the whole crop, that it is blessed by God, okay? That it is approved, if you will. And uh, if you think about it, I know I've mentioned this before, this little offering, you know, imagine I had two loaves of bread, would have been about two cups of flour out of the entire wheat offering of Israel. Now, Israel is a small country, right? But even then, if you gathered all the wheat, it would have been barn loads and barn loads and barn loads of wheat. And out of all that, just two cups were used to make these two loaves of bread. And that was the first fruit offering. And so the small is used by God to indicate something about the whole, the large. And smallness is built into the symbolism of the first fruits. It's part of what first fruits are all about. And there's other 
regulations and instructions about offerings of first fruits in the scripture, and it's always something very small, very small. And so the whole concept of first fruits involves smallness, smallness. And God chooses to work in this way. And he uses analogies of small things that grow into big things. You know, when, he's, um, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, look at the parables about the kingdom of God. And there's several in there that talk about something very small that becomes big, like the mustard seed, right? Something super duper small that becomes huge. It's an analogy that God really likes. And God chooses to work with a small little thing, maybe a mustard seed. Maybe you could think of us as like a mustard seed, okay? And he leaves the rest for later. He wants growth, but he starts with something very, very small. And God's work of spiritual creation rolls out in stages. So a small seed can become a seedling, can grow into a large plant, okay? And why does God do this? You know, why not just like whoo, get a whole mustard bush and just like have it just appear? Why doesn't the church just boom, all up here? Why do people have to go out and preach? Why do people have to teach? Why do people have to talk to others and convert others? Why can't God do all that? <laughs> he's, he's powerful enough to do it all. Why does he do it, right? Why does he start in a small way working up to something big? Why? Because he wants to share with us that experience, if you will. God chooses to work with a small group and then it grows bigger. And in this way, God distributes the work of proclamation and teaching and setting of an example and so forth among human beings. Because he wants us to be involved in what he's doing. Like when you've got children, and you know, a lot of us have had kids. Not everybody here has had kids, but when, well, we've all been kids, there you go. And parents will give children a task, right? knowing full well that they could do it better. <laughs> Am I right? And you kind of, okay, well, I'm going to, all right, I'm going to ask you to wash the dishes. Knowing full well, I'm probably going to have to go back and rewash some of these dishes, right? Why do you do that? You do it to teach them, but to, so that they might be involved in the household and the maintenance of the household. And, and there's a feeling of accomplishment and working together, and it's good for children. God likes to get others involved. He wants to get you involved. And he works in a small way. So, I'm a little lost without my slides, you know. Usually at this point I, I, <laughs> I click a slide and then you know I'm transitioning. So, let's transition, all right? The small offering of first fruits is headed for bigger things, like that, that mustard seed, okay? The return of Jesus Christ to restore the rule of God on earth is coming. And it's coming soon. Well, I mean, I'm not going to set a date or anything, but by my estimations, you know, the, the times are ripe. Let's put it that way. I think it's coming soon. And when it happens, God will begin working with big numbers. He'll work with much larger numbers of people. But he still won't do all the work himself. I'm not going to change that at all. He will continue to distribute the task to whom? To the first fruits. To the first fruits who've been trained, who've been given that opportunity to wash the dishes. And, you know, and learn a little bit about it. He gives that opportunity to the first fruits who've been prepared, who've been mentored, tested. And when he returns, they will be raised to life. And they will function as teachers and administrators and judges and so forth. And we talk about that at, at different times. We get into that more in the fall holidays. But that all begins now. It begins in a small way with the church, which began at Pentecost. And the church is small. It's the mustard seed, if you will. Big numbers, they'll come. God will work with big numbers. Christ is currently training and preparing first fruits. So the title for the message this afternoon is Preparing of the First Fruits. And he prepares these first fruits 
through his church. Right? The first words are the church, but together we are something else, right? We are a body. We work together. And through the church, God is doing this work. He is training the first fruits for something bigger. He's not working through isolated prophets who stand on a hill somewhere meditating and, and waiting for someone to climb the mountain for mysterious insight. He's not working through independent Christians who you know, come up with their own take on things and isolate themselves from others. He's working with a group of people who basically are willing to work together and work through some of the differences because that's God's way and that's how the millennium is going to work. That's how the rule of Christ is going to work. We have to learn those lessons and we learn those through the church. We learn to be the first fruits through the church. And it's a small group. It's a small group of people who are begotten by the Holy Spirit. And that all goes back to the first century. We have that record in the book of Acts. But a group of people who are filled with God's Spirit, and that's, that's good. You know, that's good for you as an individual, me as an individual. It's good to have God's Spirit. But we're filled with God's Spirit, and then we're organized together and unified by His truth. And that takes some work, right? It, it takes work to stick together. It's a lot easier to go off on your own. But it takes work to stick together. And that's an important thing to God. When the fullness of time comes, the church will be raised at his return. And they will become assistants to Christ. And they will work with him, implementing the will of God on earth. And God has drawn you. He's drawn you to himself to prepare. That's what your present work is really all about, to prepare. The reason that you've been called now instead of some other time is so that you might prepare for the next step, for the time when salvation will be opened up to the vast majority of humanity, when the big numbers are going to be what it's all about. So let's talk a little bit about the church of the firstborn and its beginning. Go to John 14, verse 15. John 14, verse 15 uh, through 20. And the beginning of the uh, firstborn, the beginning of the, the church of the firstborn, is very much tied into the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 says, If you love me, he's speaking here to his followers, to the disciples, but in all things scriptural, it's also speaking to you today. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept it, because it neither sees it nor knows it. But you know it, it will live with you, and it will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. And on that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So Jesus is telling his church, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to set a task for you and then just leave you alone and let you fall on your face. Yes, sometimes, you know, we have troubles and things don't go right and we learn through trials and mistakes. But God says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to, I'm going to be there with you through the Holy Spirit. And you will have power through this Holy Spirit. Now, go with me to Acts chapter 1. And let's read verses 4 and 5. At this stage of the narrative, Acts is kind of an extension of the Gospels. Well, that's exactly what it is, not kind of. Jesus has been raised. He's interacting with the disciples. He's talking with them. He's basically giving them some parting lessons, 
instructions and so forth. Pick it up in verse 4, and it says, On one occasion, while he, that's the resurrected, raised Christ, was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard about from me. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, read that one as well. Let's read that one. Um, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now just turn a page over to Acts 2. Let's read verses 1 through 4 there. So now it happens, okay? It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Remember yesterday I was talking about how the analogy of wind was used so often to talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, here's another one, okay? It says, A wind blew through them. But that wasn't what was important. The wind was just letting them know this is the Spirit. A violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting, and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. So Pentecost, 31 AD, marked the beginning of this spiritually energized church. The Holy Spirit gave it power, gave it energy, Israel had been a church, you know, they'd been a, the church in the wilderness, but this was something different. The church was going to be different now, and the Holy Spirit moved through the church in a way that it never had before. And this is a major development in how God was dealing with humanity, and is continuing to deal with humanity. But he only is dealing with, or has dealt with, a tiny minority. Only a tiny minority are called and then chosen. The scriptures say many are called. Many are called. But few are chosen. Doesn't it say that? It does. Smallness. Many are called. Few are chosen to enter the program. Okay. Let's talk about access to the Holy Spirit. Access to the Holy Spirit. Access to the Holy Spirit has actually been limited. God's limited it. You might think, well, the Holy Spirit's so awesome, why in the world would anyone ever limit it? Well, God has limited it. Um, go with me to Genesis chapter 2. The great book of beginnings. And we'll look at uh, where that limitation began. Genesis 2 Verses 8 through 9 tell us that the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, Eden. He put the man that he'd formed there. And the God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden, there were, there were these two trees. Most people think of the tree with the apple, where Eve, you know, reaches for the forbidden fruit. That's, you know, mostly what, when people think of a tree in the Garden of Eden, that's the one they're thinking about, right? But that's not the only tree that's in the garden. It says here, in the middle of the garden was the tree of life and then the tree of knowledge and good and evil, okay? So eating of this tree of life will find, would have put Adam on a path to spiritual creation. And the opportunity for access to that power of life, symbolized by that tree, was right there in the very beginning. In the very, very beginning. But, you probably know this story, but if you don't, I'm going to give you a little recap of it. The first human beings chose to eat from the other tree, which was forbidden. And because of this terrible, terrible, terrible choice, humanity as a whole, including each and every one of us has been cut off from direct access to God's Holy Spirit, to that life-giving tree. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. 
And uh, I'll read from 22 to 24. And this is after all the bad stuff has happened with the serpent and the apple and you know all that kind of stuff, right? And God has to do something. It says in verse 22, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat. So that other tree, no, no, no. They weren't gonna be allowed to just reach out and grab that. They couldn't grab the tree of disobedience and then just turn around and grab the tree of life. No, no, no. God said, no, no, no. That, no. We're not going to let that happen. They can't be allowed to reach out their hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him, that's Adam, from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man out and he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden carabim with a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. That's the spirit of God, the spirit, the power of life, which we talked about yesterday in the sermon. And we're all cut off from it. Unless God draws us to himself, calls us, and there's a choosing. Without the spirit of God within a human being, we won't have life. And we'll never reach our full potential as a spirit-born child of God. And we'll never go beyond the flesh and blood existence. So it's a big deal. And being cut off from it is a bad, bad, bad thing. And the day of Pentecost is about how that begins to turn around. It just begins, but only in a small way. So let's talk about now how access to the Holy Spirit was opened up through Christ, through Jesus, what he did. For those who believe on Christ, who repent, uh, who, who seek forgiveness, who are baptized into his death, who receive the laying on of hands, a path back to that tree, the tree that was in the garden that they were not going to be allowed to have access to, a path back to that tree becomes available. And it's opened up. And the Spirit of Christ within you guides you into God's truth. Once you've gone through that path and you've, you've had access again to this tree of life, then you are guided into developing the mind of Christ and preparing yourself for an active role in the administration of God's will on earth when Christ returns. But it's only a small thing. It's not everybody. The driving purpose of this present stage of God's plan is preparing for the establishment of Christ's rule on earth. And that is when he will start working with large numbers. When Jesus came in the flesh, he didn't come to establish the kingdom of God. That's not why he came. He wasn't going for the big numbers, you could say. No, not at all. If he wanted, then he would have. But the record shows that's not what happened. He often spoke to big crowds, you know, tens of thousands of people. But he spoke in, in parables, right? That's how he's known, this you know, great storyteller, and he would tell these parables. And you get the sense, you, know, you read that people were just enthralled by, he was, by what he was saying. But they didn't get it. <laughs> At the same time, they didn't get it. And uh, they couldn't understand it. And he said as much himself, I speak to these people and they're not getting it. But to the disciples, he said, but to you, I'm going to explain it. And there are, uh, not all the parables are this way, but uh, like the parable of the sower is a great example, where the disciples come to him afterwards and they say, what was that all about? And then he explains it to them. And you have access to that and you can see that now. But the crowds that were in front of him, uh, they didn't understand what he was talking about. Okay? He would explain it to, later to the disciples in plain language, but to the vast multitude of people all around him, um, most of them just remained kind of clueless. 
and therefore unchanged. The disciples were people who were chosen. They were called, they heard, they heard the parable, but they were chosen. I think it's because how they responded to what they heard. One of the things that you notice about some of the parables is, of all the people who hear the parables, the disciples come later and they say, can you explain that to me? And that's an important step. How did they respond to what they heard? They wanted to understand it instead of just kind of enjoying the entertainment value of the nice story. I know I'm, I'm reading a bit into it, but uh, you'll just have to accept that as a bit of flair. The disciples were chosen, okay? God chose them, Jesus chose them. They were the first fruits. They were the first ones chosen, but they were called, why? They were called to perform a mission. And they were called to participate with him in this mission. If you think about it, I mean, Jesus being who he was and having all power at his, the snap of his fingers, he didn't need them, did he? He didn't really need the disciples. But he called them because he wanted them to be involved in what was going on. But he called a small group of, of people, only 12 at first, only 12. If God wanted everybody to understand, then they would understand. But for now, God is leaving the vast majority of people alone, He's leaving them to their own devices. So let's get back to starting out small. Let's talk about that again. Go back to the book of Acts. And uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Now we're getting to the point where Jesus is gone. He's ascended. The disciples are left to their own. They've got a work to do. Chapter 1, verse 15 says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering, wow, it was numbering 120. 120. And he said, brothers and sisters, the scriptures have been fulfilled, and so forth. So out of the tens of thousands of people who heard Jesus himself speak and teach, only 120 people were convicted and dedicated. Go with me to Acts 2. Oh, I think we already read that, 2 verse 1 through 4. Yeah, we read that already. And then when the day of Pentecost came, Acts 2, verse 1, they were together, the mighty blowing wind came, and they received the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, they became the first members of God's church. They began, or they were the foundation of God's church. And what did they do? Well, they began teaching and proclaiming to others. And that's God getting us involved beginning with them. And what happened? Well, 3,000 people repented and were baptized on that day. Now, these were not people who had been taught by Jesus. Okay? These were other people. <laughs> these were people who had come to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost from all over the Roman Empire. Everywhere there were Jewish people. And uh, let's see, Acts 2, verse 5. Let's go there. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Okay, so that is what we're dealing with. People from all over the Roman Empire. Okay, and they come for Pentecost. And they're all there. So this was a great opportunity. And then in verse 8, it says, uh, well, let me just read the whole thing. When they heard the sound, okay, of the rushing wind, Okay, when they heard this sound, a crowd came in bewilderment because each of, the, each of them now heard in their own language something being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are, speaking, uh, who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene visiting Jerusalem, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages. And they were amazed, and they were perplexed, 
And they asked each other, what does this mean? And out of those people, 3,000 were converted. Okay? So the first converts, the disciples, who later were called apostles, did a wonderful thing. They did a great work. And these 3,000 people were taught by the disciples, not by Jesus, but by the disciples, who had themselves been trained and commissioned to teach by Jesus. And so the numbers grew, okay? So the numbers were really, really super small, 120. They grew, so now there were thousands. And we don't know how much it grew. Really don't know. It, it grew quite a bit, perhaps even into the six-figure category. Who knows? You know, could have been over 100,000, could have been a couple hundred thousand. We don't know. There was really no record of it. We don't know how big it got. But it grew. And you know, the scriptures just say people were at it every day. And it was really great. And there was lots of growth. And there was lots of stuff happening. Then something happened. Something bad. Then persecution settled in. Just like Jesus had said. He said there's going to be persecution. Things aren't going to go your way. Bad stuff's going to happen. People are going to be working against you. And it, it happened. You, you all know the story of, of Saul. He was a persecutor. He went around chasing down church members, throwing them in jail, executing them. There was serious persecution going on. Persecution from the Jews, persecution from the Romans, persecution from within, from ravenous wolves within. And these are all matters of recorded history. Okay. I don't have to take my word for it. And the number of, of people, of Christians, who remained true to the truth of God as originally taught, because of that, remained very small. And they were often forced to flee to remote places when persecution got really intense. And I've gone through that in other messages, how persecution has, has worked. Uh, I think the, the message that comes to mind is the one I did on the Council of Nicaea. But because of all this, so there's a big group of people out there, but who's staying true to the truth is a small group of people, a small flock. As Jesus had said, you're a small flock. A small flock. Now, the, the truth of God has largely remained obscured, covered over and obscured for the past 2,000 years. What we've got in its place is, is kind of a mixed bag of human folklore, philosophic speculation, and garbled half-truths. And you see this when, you know, sometimes when you're talking with people and they find out that you're a believer, they'll make some assumptions. Oh, well, then you believe this ridiculous thing, right? No, I don't believe that. That's not the truth. That's not biblical. That's something else. You think that's Christianity, but it's not. I don't know if you've ever been in that position. My guess is you have. But the number of people who are really focused on the truth of God still remains very small. And as with the parables, many hear the words. They hear the words, but they don't have the understanding of the truth. And, you know, there are lots of churches out there with really big numbers. Big numbers. They've got big buildings. They wouldn't have to meet in a crummy little room like this. Well, it's not a crummy room. I didn't give you a crummy room. You know what I'm talking about. They wouldn't have to be crowded into a room with no padding on the chairs. No way. No way. That would be beneath them. <laughs> they have fine buildings. and They've got lots of money. Lots of working capital. But do they have the truth of God? Do they have the truth of God? Well, when you look at it hard and, and you know, really dig in, most of it's a counterfeit version. It kind of looks like the truth of God, but it's a counterfeit. You know, a counterfeit bill, the whole idea is to look like the real thing, you know? So it's got all the right numbers and stuff, but it's just... <laughs> Something about it just doesn't smell right. It's like listening to one of these new AI-generated songs, you know? It's like, something just doesn't sound right in there. It's a counterfeit version. It looks legit, but look closely and nah, it's not. 
But the truth of God is still out there. It's still out there. It's being proclaimed by the church of God. So it can be found. And for the most part, again, you know, it falls on deaf ears. But by preaching the truth, we are assisting in the preparations for the coming kingdom of God on earth. Doing the work. And small, very small, ridiculously small sometimes, painfully small. You know, especially when you're, you're looking for someone to get married to. You know, it's like it's a small, you realize how small it is when you start doing that, you know. It's small. It's very small. But we're doing work. Even small as we are, we provide a witness, ensuring that the information is out there. Okay, it's out there. We can't force people to believe or do anything about it, right? But we put it out there. Um, we provide living proof that unless God draws a person to himself, they're really kind of helpless. You can't find him without that drawing, without that calling, without that choosing. And without the Holy Spirit, understanding remains limited and mixed up. Mixed up. You know? A lot of understanding is got truth in it, but it's also got this other stuff in it that's not true. And that's a problem. For those who do hear and respond, the church also serves as an instrument through which God draws men and women into the process of salvation and spirit-born life. Okay? Why? So that they may be prepared for an assisting role when God opens up the process of salvation big time. And that's what the prophecies are all about. The millennium is all about the truth going big time nationwide. And the church is about preparing people for that. We're all about basically putting the mustard seed in the ground, if you will. It's small, but it's a preparation. It's a preparation. And we are working as a church to prepare people. I mean, the church is, you are the church, right? Each and every one of you are the church, but the church is also working on you and with you, okay? Why? So that you might be ready to participate and fulfill your role as well. Uh, go to Ephesians 4. I think I hit on this yesterday. Here it says, so Christ gave himself, or sorry, Christ himself gave the apostles, and prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? Why is the church doing what it does? Well, it's to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The church is all about helping you get there. But on the other hand, you are the church, right? So we're helping one another. It's a family affair. <laughs> we do it together. And God is doing it with us through the Holy Spirit that's in us, bringing us, drawing us together, binding us together so that this, this can be done. But the church's purpose is not merely to help you work out your own salvation before God. That's not, not what it's all about. That's a happy byproduct of what's happening. The fact that you get to, to be part of the first resurrection, that you even get resurrected at all, is a happy byproduct. What's really happening is that the church is preparing the first fruits. And as a first fruit, it's only a tiny portion of the full crop set apart so that the entire crop can be blessed. And that's what the first fruits were all about. They would wave the loaves so that the whole harvest of wheat could be blessed. The first fruits are small, they're representative, but their purpose is that the entire crop might be blessed. And the church and the work that the church is doing through you and with you is to prepare you for that time when big numbers happen, and they will happen. The entire crop will be drawn in. If you go to um, Revelation 20, verse 6, or 
Revelation 1 verse 6 or even 1 Peter 2 verse 9, all those places in Scripture tell us that the first fruits are a spirit-born priesthood. Right? Spirit-born priesthood. That's heady stuff. Don't let it go to your head, though. We have a role, though. We have a role. We have a purpose. What is that? Go to Malachi 2, verse 7. What's a priest supposed to do? You might think, oh boy, a priest, well, you know, they give sacrifice, they do all this stuff. But it's, they had a lot more to do than that. And this is a very important role for the priest here. Malachi 2, verse 7 says, For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, because the priest is the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and the people seek instruction from the priest's mouth. So a priest is a teacher. A priest is a teacher. The first fruits are a spirit-born priesthood of teachers. That's what it means to be a priest, if you will. You know? It doesn't mean that you get to walk around in fancy clothes, kill animals. You'll probably get some great clothes, but your primary role is going to be as a teacher. Okay? So when we talk about first fruits, we talk about smallness, does this mean that God is showing favoritism towards a small group of people? Is he being a respecter of persons? Is he showing favoritism? Is that what's going on here? Well, consider the role of witnessing. Okay, Consider what it means to be a witness. Billions hear the truth. Billions get the same biblical information that you do. It's not a secret book. You're not the only one who's got it. Millions of people access, just to, just to think about our website, the UCG website, which is just a drop in the bucket. Millions of people access the UCG website. They have the truth explained to them, but they don't do anything about it. They don't do anything about it. But to some, he gives his spirit, which gives understanding, which gives life. And what does God say about who he gives his spirit to? Go to Acts 5, verse 32. Acts 5, verse 32. Another scripture about the Holy Spirit. Very important one. It's a good memory scripture for those of you who are, are young. It says, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, which God has given to those who obey him. Now, we haven't really focused on that very much. We do that at other times. But to whom does God give his spirit? If the calling goes out, and many are called, and few are chosen, what makes the difference? How do you respond to the calling? If you hear the calling and don't do anything about it, has it done you any good? No. But if you hear the calling and you do something about it, that makes a difference. And the scriptures tell us here, to whom does God give his spirit? To those who obey. How do you obey before you have God's spirit? Well, a great example, great example, not the only example, but a great one is, God gives you something small to do. He starts off with something very small. Okay? For a lot of us, it was probably, I want you to come before me on Saturday. Will you do it? And a lot of people say no. Now, for me, it actually wasn't the, wasn't the Sabbath. That's not the first thing that came before me. The first thing for me was tithing. Weird, okay? But it was a small little thing, very simple thing. Okay? I want you to tithe. And uh, I was very poor. I didn't have any money. So in some ways, tithing was pretty easy for me because it didn't involve giving a whole lot. But I did something. I learned it, and it was like, ah, ah. And to me, though, and I, I'm not saying this to say I'm, I'm a great person because I'm definitely not, but what I'm getting at is God asks you to do something small. What does he want to see? Will you respond? Will you respond in a positive way? And I think that there are a number of things like that. You know, the Sabbath is a big one. 
Um, for me, it was tithing, weirdly. Then Sabbath came later. And those are important things to God. Will you obey? Or will you want things your own way? And that's hard. It's hard to obey. Because sometimes the, the first little thing that you're asked to obey is, is kind of weird. And you think, well, that's weird. Why would, why would that make any difference? You know, think about me with tithing. Here I am, you know, I'm 23 years old. I really don't have any money. But I, I think, well, tithing. Yeah, but God is all powerful. Why would it make any difference to him if I tithe or not? I mean, you know, as we heard about in the <laughs> offertory message, he is the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, why does he need my meager little check? He doesn't. He wants to see if I'll do something with what I've learned, with what I've been given, with the calling that I've received. Will you respond to it, Craig? And he did that with you as well, in your own way. I don't know what it was. So those who are called and chosen to be first fruits do something. And they will be doing a number of different things. I mean, the, the first little thing that you're, you're called to do is usually not the hardest one. <laughs> it's usually something really super easy. But those who are called and chosen have more things to do. They have to exert effort in overcoming Satan. That gets way harder. Overcoming the prevailing culture, overcoming themselves. And that requires discipline. And it requires application, careful attention, self-denial, and making some very hard choices. I mean, you know, getting back to Sabbath keeping, just keeping the Sabbath involves making some hard choices. It does. It's tough. Simple, but not easy. <laughs> and it's a price, and I'm not just spoke, speaking of the Sabbath here, I'm speaking of obedience to God, is a price that most human beings are not willing to pay. They don't want to do it. And that makes all the difference. So God's not showing favoritism to people. He just wants to see what we're going to do. So, let's talk about being prepared, showing that you are prepared, okay? Jesus demonstrated his qualifications to rule. He, he did great stuff. He overcame the flesh. He overcame the world. He overcame Satan. So are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you ready to assist Christ in his rule? Now when you start, and I, I don't say this because I know any secrets about you, when you start at first, you are definitely not prepared. <laughs> I know that. I just know that. You're not ready, are you, when you first start, when God first calls you and you, you, you first start walking down this path. You're not ready. You're not qualified at all. You know, and oftentimes you probably think, how could this ever work out? How could I ever be qualified? But to help you develop the skills that you need and the talents you need to assist in that time when the big numbers will happen, God has given you his spirit so that you might learn how to rule, to teach, to judge, maybe even to wash dishes. God's given you his Holy Spirit. Okay? And when the time is right, God will open up salvation and the whole process to the vast majority of people who've ever lived. And in the next stages of his plan, circumstances will be very different. They will be. I don't think that... The, we know or can know everything, but I think the circumstances will be very different. And I'm speaking of what happens with the fall holy days, of course, and we'll talk about that when the fall holy days come around. But the circumstances are going to be different. Big numbers are going to be happening. What will be different? Well, the forces of spiritual wickedness will not prevail. Okay, they will be bound. That's going to be a biggie. Christ will be bodily present that will be a biggie, okay? I mean, if you could see Christ, you'd think that'd make a difference. You'd think that, but I don't, I don't know if it will. Remember that, you know, when Thomas doubted, Jesus was resurrected, and he, he said, uh, I, don't, I won't believe what you guys say. You say you saw Jesus resurrected, I won't believe it till I see it. And Jesus 
talked to Thomas and he said, Thomas, you know, and he asked him to stick his fingers in the holes in his hand and, and Thomas just wouldn't accept it until he actually stuck his fingers in the holes in Christ's resurrected body. And Jesus said, well, it's a good thing that you believe, but blessed are those who believe in me even though they haven't seen me. So people will see Christ. That's going to be good. That'll be a biggie. One more thing. Oh, you'll be there. You'll be resurrected, present as people who are kind of like a witness yet again of this can work and this can happen. And the way of the first fruits is it's a difficult path. It's not an easy path at all. Not easy at all. The path is narrow. And the way is hard. And Jesus told us that. It's narrow, it's hard, and, and many fall away even. But God empowers his church. So let's talk about God empowering his church. Because that's what we need to focus on. Because for now, we've got a job to do. Which is to preach the truth. Which is to prepare a people. That's our motto. But neither of those things is going to happen without the power of God's Spirit at work in His church and in each and every one of us because you are the church. Go to John 14, verse 10. John 14, verse 10, which says this, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak of my own authority. This is Jesus speaking, remember? And he says, the words I'm speaking to you, I don't speak of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So it was the power of God's Spirit doing the works through his human flesh. As a, he was a human being, like you, like me. He didn't have superpowers. But he let God work through him through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're in chapter 14, look at verse 16. It says, And I will ask the Father, he will give you an advocate to help you and be with you forever. Jesus promises that same power. This, he's talking about the same power that he had flowing through him to do all the great stuff that he did. And he said, this is the power of the Father working through me. And then he said, I'm going to give this to you as well. Cool. <laughs> Jesus promises the same spiritual power to you, to you. I don't know if you've ever thought about the Holy Spirit and you know its presence in you in that way, but it's the same power that he, as a human being in the flesh, remember he, he was God in the flesh, the power that worked through him. Not only must you have it, you got to yield to it. And, you know, because like we said, who, who does God give his spirit to? Those who obey. Uh, the scriptures also say, those who are led by the Spirit, those are the children of God. You have the Spirit, but you don't follow it? That's no, not going to work out. Spirit doesn't override your free will. It just points you in the right direction. And it even urges you, convicts you perhaps, to make the right choice. You have to make the right choice. You do. And you do it every day, every hour. You have to choose. Acts, we're going to go back to Acts. This will be the last scripture. We'll wrap it up for today. Acts 1 verse 8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the present and future purpose of the first fruits is this preparation, a small work that's done in preparing for something larger. A small offering meant to represent the blessing that's put on the whole crop. That's what first fruits are all about. You're participating in the future kingdom of God right now and announcing the future kingdom of God right now. And in everything you're going through, your trials, your tests, your triumphs, your failures, if, if everything that you were going through right now was just for you, was just for your own personal salvation, then God wouldn't have needed to call you as a first fruit. 
He could have left it. You could have been resurrected later. Your personal salvation would have been taken care of. But as a first fruit, you're called now so that you can have a part to play when the big numbers come in. And that's how God works. He works with something small and grows it big because he wants participation. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. God wants participation. He wants everybody to get involved. Those who are willing. So your calling as a first fruit isn't just about you. It's a calling that is about you and your place in the next step where God's plan is headed next. The thousand year rule of Christ, the resurrection of the rest of the dead, as the scriptures say, when salvation will be opened to all. Spiritually growing first fruits will have their heart in the work that God is doing. And I don't just mean, you know, a TV program or a magazine or whatever. I'm talking about the work that God is doing in preparing for the kingdom of God in you. Because that's the mustard seed. There is another work, of course, pro proclaiming the truth. Other people have to hear about it. You had to hear about it at some point. I had to hear about it at some point. You're part of that as well. And then the preparation of the first fruits themselves, which is you. And that's the present work of the Holy Spirit. 